make Madison a city where everyone has the opportunity to thrive. I hope that we will continue making the kinds of progress we have over the last eight years. It looks like the, the, the lead is uh, quite large uh, and uh, that, that a recount would, would, not be, would, would not make a whole lot of sense if, if that's what Judge Neubauer decides to do. Uh, we are certainly uh, more than ready for that. We have seen near record turnout and a razor thin margin. And so now, the morning after the election, this race is still too close to call. The results are in, Phil, sort of. Satya Rhodes Conway trounces Paul Soglin for mayor. That's a landslide, that victory. And in the high court race, Judge Hagedorn, the conservative candidate. No, no, he's completely nonpartisan. <laughs> he only looks at the Constitution, Scott. Narrowly, apparently, defeats Judge Neubauer, the liberal backed candidate. Completely nonpartisan. By a sliver, and there could be a recount, although it's almost 6,000 vote difference. That's a hard difference to make up in these sort of elections, unless somebody can find a box full of 8,000 votes in Dane County somewhere. (laughs) I was surprised by a couple of things. One was that Satya won by so much. It was a a huge victory for Satya Rhodes-Conway. And the other thing was that Judge Hagedorn won. I thought the left was still more riled than the right, generally speaking. And I thought that with the big mayoral election in Madison, that was just going to turn out, relatively speaking, for a spring primary, big numbers for of liberal voters who, no matter who they chose for Madison mayor, they were going to vote for Judge Neubauer. Yeah, and, and I would have agreed with you before um, last night's results came in. <laughs> but we'll talk about last night's mm-hmm. results and the election at the spring a nonpartisan election on today's episode of Center Stage. I'm Scott Milfred, the editorial page editor for the Wisconsin State Journal. And I'm Phil Haynes. I'm the editorial cartoonist for the Wisconsin State Journal. We are half of the State Journal editorial board. The better looking half. wasn't so bad. We've been on vacation. We, we haven't done this for a couple of weeks. Yeah, but it's we been can, a while since we, we podcasted. Still, we can still podcast. We still got it, man. Well, I was sick last week, two oh, weeks ago. Right. I was yeah. sick. I couldn't come in. We were going to podcast, and you're like, no, no, I don't want to be in a closed room with you, Phil. Because yeah, you fact, were going on vacation the next week. That's right, and you even kindly stayed home that Friday Yeah, to so as not to infect me. Yeah. And then, yeah, I got to go on spring break, went with the family down to St. Louis, Rode the arch, went to breweries, a lot of beer in St. Louis. Let's get to these election results. I mean, the thing that stands out to me, and of course, you know how the cartoonist is the numbers guy, of course. Exactly. Um, But I was looking at the numbers, and I would have, I would have totally thought that the Democrats are still fired up. They're still mad at Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And this blue wave that we saw crest in November of 2018 was still, Mm -hmm. was still going strong. But that apparently is not the case. And here's why I'm saying that. I'm surprised, first of all, that turnup was up across the state for this election compared to last spring's Supreme Court race. So last spring there was a Supreme Court ra- base race. Rebecca Dallet defeated mm-hmm. Michael Skrenok in a Supreme Court election. Handily defeated Handily him. Handily defeated. But across the board, turnout was up this year. But in mm-hmm. the conservative counties, I looked at Waukesha County and, and Washington County, which are generally part of the mm-hmm. WOW trio around suburban Milwaukee counties. Wow. The WOW counties. WOW! <laughs> um, and I compared them to Dane County and Milwaukee County, where yeah. a ton of Democrats uh, are. And what did you find out? Dane County uh, turnout was up 14%, which is good, I would think, right? Over la- since, so this election, the turnout was 14% higher than the last Supreme Court uh, election. And that would make some sense just because there was a mayoral election. Yep. And Milwaukee County was also up 15%, which so similar percentage hmm. rates increase. But in now, now Waukesha and, and Washington County, yeah. 30% increase over 2018. Hmm. So, so almost twice. So a, a really big jump in conservative people going to the polls. Yeah. And maybe that's. Maybe that I, maybe that's backlash against you know people are upset that Walker lost the election 
in 2018. Mm-hmm. Maybe people are more fired up and realizing their vote counts. Maybe it was this candidate in particular who's from Waukesha County. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it's the attack on his religious faith, which he, which he played up very well with religious voters, I think, and mm-hmm. said, you know, I'm being attacked because of my faith. We can't let that happen. He was being attacked because he was pretty much a homophobe. But Onward Christ- Christian soldiers. Yeah, but... Um, because of some of the homophobic things he'd said in the past. Uh, and did not distance himself from. Yeah. The Republicans just had sort of a big victory nationally in which Trump did not collude with the Russians. Totally fake. Totally fake news. Collusion, delusion. Liberal um, media out to get yeah, people. Yeah, so I mean... And know. Hagedorn played up that whole liberal media thing. Yeah. I mean, he railed against the press for reporting about... His homophobic blog posts, which he refused to distance himself from, yeah, and the the his school that he's on the head of that had policies against gay teachers, mm-hmm. um, so and he railed against the press for you know smearing him and it, not just smearing him but attacking his religious beliefs. Yeah, and I would have liked to drill down on that a little bit had he come in to meet with our editorial board. They called, they were setting up a meeting, and uh, then they never. They never, in the end, came in. It would have and been Neubauer nice to, did. Neubauer came in. It would have been nice to talk to him because Michael Skrenik came in last yeah. year, and we and were it was impressed. Really, it was yeah, it was nice to talk to him. It was good yeah, to see he's that a he sharp was. Guy. He was uh, you know you you had the you had the feeling he was going to be. You felt comfortable with that race because you're like this guy's going to be a decent judge either yeah. way. Yeah. Neither of these candidates, I don't think, were nonpartisan judges who were just looking at the law. They both professed to be. But it was almost laughable. It was laughable. And because, as we've said before, you know, you don't get very far in a Supreme Court race unless you either have liberal backing or conservative backing. Yeah. If people don't know how you're going to rule on cases, they don't support you with with f- fundraising. You know, yeah. independent jurists are not welcome on the Supreme Court because of the way we have our election system. Yeah. Now, to be fair, neither one of the candidates could really point to rulings by the other that were just sort of blatantly partisan. I was kind of surprised by that because they both um, have been serving on the same appeals court for a while. I I believe she was actually his boss. Yeah. So you'd think they they would know all the votes and the cases, but maybe they didn't get any, you know, I guess they didn't get Act 10 over there. Like or maybe that here. sort of stuff is just too complicated to talk about in a judicial yeah, campaign. It could be. One of the questions I always like to ask a Supreme Court candidate is, give me some examples of cases where you followed the law even though you didn't like it. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, I remember Skrenek was able to give us some answers, yeah. and Rebecca Dallet was, but Neubauer couldn't really. She didn't really come up with anything specific. Anything specific. I, and you know. he didn't come in to tell us, so we don't know about that either. But. We used to have this position that we were uh, in favor of merit selection. We wanted to get rid of the uh, elections for Supreme Court justices. And the more and more candidates, the more and more races I'm part of this editorial board for, I'm like, man, you know, we're just not getting great candidates for the yeah. Supreme Court. These judicial elections turn our best judges into the worst of politicians. That's right. Judge Neubauer did put a statement on Facebook today. We're, we're cutting this uh, podcast on Wednesday steering supporters to her website and the first big button you can see there is contribute we need to make sure that every last vote is counted and that's going to take a little time and we're going to need your help so please go to my website at judgenewbauer.com and sign up to volunteer and support our efforts. So if she's going to need a half a million dollars, she's not within the margin to get a free recount, so she'd no. have to pay for it. So my guess is, hey, if she can come up with a half a million dollars, they'll do a recount. If and, she can't, they won't. Uh, what was it, 2011, when Kloppenberg, uh, Supreme Court candidate, had thought she'd beaten a conservative justice, David Prosser, yeah. and she declared victory. And then next day they found out in Waukesha <laughs> County there were 7,000 ballots that had not been counted. Yeah. Uh, that's the only thing I think that could save Neubauer right now is if they found 7,000 votes somewhere in Dane County. Those turnout numbers in Waukesha County and uh, – and in and, and Washington County, those are impressive that there's, you know, they had a 30 percent mm-hmm. increase over last year's Supreme Court election. That, that shows uh, that, 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 that Hagedorn's message or either resonated with people or conservatives are fired up. It goes back to this sort of divided state. In, in, lots of elections in Wisconsin are really close. And here you have a conservative justice 
running and I guess based on our analysis here, maybe barely winning by not walking back his anti-gay views by sort of stressing them as people coming after my religion. And he's yeah. using that to build enthusiasm. Well, at the same time here in Madison, you have a newly elected mayor who at her victory st- speech made a point of saying she's the first openly gay mayor of Madison. Tonight, I am full of hope. Hope for young people everywhere, but especially here in Madison that have felt left out or talked down to or bullied because of who they are. I have felt that way once upon a time, and look where I am now. So you've got kind of the two opposites fueling both sides in a way. Well, you know, I think part of it is that everybody, you know, everybody likes to feel bullied to a certain extent. I mean, Hagedorn basically played it up like Mm -hmm. liberal Madison is bullying me or the liberal media is bullying me for my religion. And, you know, it's, you know, playing the victim as becoming a uh, is uh, politics uh, tactic du jour is everybody's out to get me for whatever I am. People were very passionate about what they saw in this race. And I think people were mobilized in a way I haven't seen. There's probably a lot of reasons for that. I think some of the attacks, again, not just on me, but on people of faith more generally, were certainly a part of that, uh, without question. Back in his blog when he was in law school, what he said was he was critical of the Supreme Court uh, striking down a law in Texas that that outlawed sodomy. Yeah. And his view at the time was that, well, this is going to open the door up to a judicial ruling that we have to allow bestiality. Yes. That was his legal analysis. Yeah, that's the thing. Is like, okay, that's offensive on one level, and I think everybody uh, around these parts in Madison paid attention to that point, which is, hey, wait, you're kind of comparing two men who love each other to some strange person with an animal. Yeah. Having sex with an animal. That is offensive. And it is. It is offensive. But at the same time... If you take that aside, also his legal analysis on that was completely flawed. Ridiculously flawed. Ridiculously flawed. We don't have bestiality now. We don't have bestiality. In fact, Andre Jock, down at the legislature, is constantly trying to pass laws (laughs) to crack down on that even more. Yeah, I guess it's a problem in his district. Yeah. You know, the other thing, and I, I want to go, I want to talk about Madison politics, yeah. but the one thing that drives me nuts about these Supreme Court races is that, you know, I, I, I have been preparing since I was, a, since I was in high school, I knew I wanted to be a political cartoonist, you know? And so throughout yeah. college and in graduate school, I would have opportunities to say things publicly or write things publicly, but I didn't, I didn't, al- I didn't always do it because I was like, you know what? I don't want people to think that this is some nut job you know, and he won't. And he won't be able to. I won't be able to be taken seriously as a political cartoonist. Mm-hmm. So I held back on what I would say in those situations. And why do I have better judgment than these people who run for Supreme Court? <laughs> yeah. Why do I take the job of political cartoonist more seriously than these people take the job of judge? It drives me yeah. nuts. Neubauer was at some climate rally. Climate rally, which. Turned into sort of an anti-Trump rally. Yeah, and I just don't know why you would go do things like that because inevitably some case will come before you having to do with climate change or regulations or something, and yeah. then you're opening yourself up to, oh, you're not going to be a fair judge. So maybe it, it just it feels sometimes like I have better judgment than these candidates for Supreme Court. <laughs> which Imagine is dis- that. Which is disturbing, isn't That is it? really it, disturbing when you put it that way, Phil. Anyway, but uh, speaking of disturbing, let's talk about Paul Soglin. No, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul... Lost, yeah, it's just I, I almost feel I was bad. Sh- I was shocked by how badly he lost this election. Yeah, he really did. She didn't just win. We knew she'd win big on the isthmus in downtown, for generally speaking. Um, but that's where the more younger people are. It's where the more progressive people are. But she won in a lot of districts across the city, and I think just people are just worn out on Solon. I think we were worn out on Saugus. We were. I mean, you know, I, I will say honestly, when we went into the endorsement process, we were almost certain we were going to endorse and vote for Soglin. I thought so too. And we sat down with him for an hour and ten minutes, and it's like, boy, this is a this is hard. Yeah, you know. And, and our podcast with his, with his interview kind of demonstrated how difficult it can be to be in a room with Paul Soglin for that period of time. And listening to her was surprisingly. It wasn't surprising that it was engaging and pleasant uh, experience, but 
I just was also impressed by some of the things she said. She doesn't seem like uh, a Madison cookie cutter progressive to me. She seems kind of uh, on a different plane above that, thinking about things in a more, you know, less partisan and more solution oriented way. Well, pragmatism, right? I mean, yeah, mayors yeah. have to be pragmatic. It's the alt. It is probably the most pragmatic job in politics, where it's not about where you stand on the issues. It's yeah. about doing things that improve your city in a tangible way. Yeah. I do think, as we said in this morning's editorial, talking about Sati Rhodes Conway's election being the start of a new era and sort of a passing of the baton from the baby boomers to new generations of Generation leadership. X, right? The best yeah, generation. They, they are the best. We are the best. Are you X? No, uh, I'm in the... I, you're Y? I'm, no, I'm in this really weird place. What so, you, uh, so Generation X starts anybody born before 1979. Yeah. Millennials start anybody born after 1981. I was born in 1980, so I am a man without a generation. <laughs> I think Sagan really was hurt by that about face last fall... Here he was running for the Democratic nomination for governor, and he made a, a big thing about, I'm not going to seek re-election as mayor. I'm all in on this governor race. Yeah. And he was absolute about it. And then he gets creamed in the Democratic primary, and then he's kind of like a month later or two months later, oh, you know what? Even though all these other people are going to run because I'm not running, I'm going to run anyway. Yeah. I think I do want to do this job. And it was quite a long time ago, but one of his terms, he did end early. He didn't finish his term. So I think there's sort of a like, you know, do you want to do this job? Do you not want to do this job? And he just kind of had this sort of attitude of it's mine. And it reminded me a little bit of when Tommy Thompson, I know they're very different politicians, but when Tommy Thompson ran for U.S. Senate and was just kind of like, hey, this is my seat. It's my job, right? Yeah. Why do I have to go through all this rigmarole campaign stuff and Go me with the editorial boards and campaign and raise Clearly money. Clearly, I'm the one who deserves yeah, this Yeah, we seat. all know I'm going to win, and he lost yeah. against Tammy Baldwin. I like that you compared Paul Soglin to Tommy Thompson. I think that's <laughs> a really good comparison. Well, they both have been kind of – they both were sort of kings of their political domains. I yeah. mean, Soglin's been king of Madison, and Tommy was king of the state. Yeah, but Soglin's lost a lot of elections, too. I mean, who knows? Maybe he runs again in four years. Sogbot 3000. <laughs> we never asked him that. You know, he won't run, but his mustache will. <laughs> I'd vote for his mustache. Yeah. As we said in the editorial, I think it was I think the voters of Madison were right. It was time for a change. It's not that Sogland hasn't done some great things for the city. I mean the downtown if you compare the downtown from the nineteen nineties to now, it's just like night and day. Yeah. Uh, it's just so thriving so much. And he's a creative thinker and he he bulldozes over people sometimes, but he's he's done a lot. And Sogland's greatest quality was that he had the bona fide liberal credentials to tell liberal yeah. Madison when they'd gone too far. Yeah. I, I'm not sure Sach is going to be able to stand up to the the loony left the same way that Sogan could. Well, we'll see. You know, I, I thought it was interesting that even though she's kind of pegged as this progressive Dane candidate, she also sat on the board of directors of the Dane County, Dane Dems, yeah. which is at times battled with progressive Danes. So, you know, I want to give her, uh, uh, as we said, uh, we we wish her great success. I want to give her the benefit of the doubt and see if she can maybe get some things done that uh, Soglin wasn't able to. For example, the, on the, the the better bus system and rapid bus system, you know, she said, hey, maybe we we resubmit our application for federal money and make it sexier. Yep. That uh, applying for money for a bus barn... It's not it's, sexy. It's kind of blah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe there's just some new ways of looking at things um, to uh, improve things. I want to say, I think Soglin, I think he really lost this election. I think when I talk to people... He got out fundraised. I mean, remember in the primary, Satya made the big thing about, well, as we all know, I got outspent by everybody. Yeah. Well, she didn't get outspent by Soglin in the general election. No. She had more money. She had more money. And I did not think that would happen. I think Soglin just, I felt, I feel like 
I talk to a lot of people I talk to, and this is just my anecdotal information, but yeah. after the primary, it's like, well, I'm probably going to vote for Sogland. I don't know any reason not to mm-hmm. vote for Sogland. And apparently... That was our attitude, too. That was our attitude, too. Both of them. And, and I, I think a lot of people are like, well, maybe Satya is the reason not to vote for Sogland. Yeah. You know, I think I think she ran a great campaign. I think he ran a really, yeah. you know, tired and kind of half... Can I say half-assed on the air yeah, campaign? Yeah, on a podcast you can. I think, I think it was Not half- in the paper, though. I think it was definitely half-assed. Um, See, the newspaper is a family newspaper. This is not a family not podcast. Not a family podcast. <laughs> we had my kids in here once, though, Scott. Oh, that's right. <laughs> she just was running a spirited campaign, a positive and optimistic campaign. She seemed to represent the future. She just looked like the future, and Sogan looked like the past. Yeah. And he was, you know— He's grumpy. Yeah. What can you say? Yeah, I don't think he spent a lot of time knocking on doors and talking I to people. I don't think he worked as hard either. I mean, just even going back to his run for governor, like, oh, I'm going to go hang out at supper clubs and wait for people to come up and approach me? Yeah. That is not a winning formula to become a gubernatorial nominee. It's a certain amount of arrogance yeah. involved that. You know, you know, and if, she did not come across as arrogant. No. And she often talked about... Uh, other people as being part of her campaign. Yeah. Maybe uh, Paul Sogan's mustache could make appearances periodically in a cartoon, you know? Or he could be that little, there could be a little mustache in the corner who would say something grumpy about the cartoon. That's not a bad idea. Especially if it was about Satya. I think that's a good idea. Satya. What if Paul Sogan would shave his mustache now that he's out of politics? Do you think that's possible? Maybe you're going incognito. I mean, who would recognize Paul Sogan had a mustache? That's like you, you, you know, who was it? So Hercules? Not Hercules. Who's the guy that... Samson. Sh- Samson shaved his head and lost all of his strength. And I think that's what would happen to Sogan. You're probably right about that. Um, but if you wanted to, you know, four years from now, hey, brand new Sogan. <laughs> no stash. <laughs> And I'm happy. What if he just grew a beard out, with, and like 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 the, like uh. the Abe Lincoln beard, and got rid of the mustache, <laughs> just to confuse everybody? We'll see. Find and follow Center Stage on Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud and in all fine stores. All of the music on Center Stage is by Tube Tester. To listen to past episodes, go to go.madison.com slash centerstage.